The Cross Nakinata. It's a common Elden meme by now that FromSoft took all the trouble to give this spear a totally unique, streamlined moveset, and nobody ever gets to see it. It's time to show the Cross Naginata some real love. I'm going to show you a complete, comprehensive breakdown on how to use a two-hand Cross Naginata. I'll go over every move, how to use them, when to use them, the best Ashes of War, and much more. I hope you enjoyed. First, let's take a look at the R1 chain. It's beautiful, unique, and really slow. Oh, and most players can poise through a hit. But don't lose hope. Let's turn that to our advantage. The R1 alone is super slow and easy to reaction roll. But recall that rolling gives 13 iframes and 8 recovery frames. It's pre precisely because the R1 is slow that if your opponent panic rolls too early, they actually set themselves up for a perfect roll catch. A slow moveset requires a precise, methodical playstyle. The second R1 is where you make your money. It's almost like a hidden crouch poke. 16 frames is not fast, but more than half of that animation is hidden behind this sneaky little step you take, which also extends its range by quite a lot. The best part is, after any other attack, including jumping, running, or your R2, the next R1 will be this follow-up poke. There is also a generous period where you can delay R1 chains, so get in the habit of holding this in your pocket for a roll catch or surprise attack. The rest of the R1 chain is also slow, but slow enough that you can actually delay each hit to roll catch your opponent four consecutive times if you are some kind of timing guide. This is where I'll mention that the Crouch R1 is probably the worst move in the toolkit. It's pretty slow and has lousy range, so just hang on to it for a mix-up. The jumping R1 is one of your best moves. It's a thrusting attack that comes out fast with extreme range, and most importantly, deals enough poise damage to stun almost any opponent. It also combos really well with the R1 poke follow-up. Overall, this move's only weakness is a heavily armored opponent. Don't forget to delay it to surprise the opponent, and also try jumping in place or even backwards to counter an approach. Just be mindful, it comes out a little too fast sometimes, and can miss at close quarters. The jumping R2 is just okay, primarily because the R1 is so good. Use it as a mix-up, or if your opponent can poise the R1, as it has less range and longer recovery. I've noticed the hitbox of this move can also be a little inconsistent. Fortunately, that Naginata has a great R2, and not whatever they gave to the pike. You even get this nice little charge animation for fully charging it. The R2 is very important, as it tracks 180 degrees, has great range, and does great poise damage. It's important to know that it's too slow to reaction roll catch, and there's a little bit of delay after you release it. It takes practice, to figure out when to release it, so I'll just let you watch it in action. Note here that it actually has perfect timing to catch quick stuff. The running R2 is an excellent approach. This is not a halberd, so you can't reaction roll catch with it. It will take a lot of practice to figure out its timing, 
which requires you to wind it up a little early. So here are some clips. And don't forget your sweet R1 follow-up if you miss. I'll close on the moveset with a few more things I forgot to mention. Thrust attacks are great for tracking jumping opponents. The running R1 is okay. Its startup frames are slow enough to catch some panic rolls, although it does lack poise damage. Your backstep attack is also too risky, as it lacks range and poise damage. Next, I tried out some of the most common Ashes of War found on Spears. I skipped through testing on Loretta's Slash, as I think, but I'm not sure that its poise damage is lower with Spears, as a lot of people could tank the first hit. Giant Hunt is definitely the most satisfying to land. People don't usually expect this from a spear, and I like how it can dodge around certain moves. The startup frames are pretty quick, and the startup motion is pretty sneaky. Your opponent's also in big trouble if they jump. You already have so many roll catch options, however, that a pretty slow, albeit tricky one, doesn't add too much to your kit. Especially since the opponent can throw off the tracking by rolling behind you. I'll come out and say it. I don't like piercing Fang that much. Maybe I'm just not good with it, but I don't get hit often by it either. The range is great, and it can track a full 180, but I find the move to be too telegraph and slow to hit more experienced opponents unless they make a mistake. That leaves Impaling Thrust, and I have a lot to say, so strap in because I'm going to give you a comprehensive breakdown on how to unlock the true potential of one of the best Ashes of War in the entire game. Impaling Thrust is an Ash I don't see nearly as often as Piercing Fang or Giant Hunt, and I think it's because a lot of people don't realize its true potential. First, let's go over its basics. Impaling Thrust is a great roll catch. Compared to Piercing Fang, it has much faster startup and recovery and still enough range to cover two medium rolls or one fast roll. It also is much less telegraphed, as the motion looks very similar to any other thrust windup. All that makes this a very high priority Ash of War that is difficult to safely punish. It also comes out fast enough to punish a lot of mistakes, and if your build permits, it makes an advantageous and safe trade for many situations like Flaming Strike. Okay, all that sounds pretty good, but how can we make Impaling Thrust even better? You probably know that with many Ashes of War, you can cut the ending animation short simply by rolling. But what if you perform an attack instead? Take a look at these two animations. The startup animation for the R2 comes out significantly faster than the R1. So much so that, based on the nature of thrusting attacks, the R2 actually connects faster than the R1. Using this knowledge, we can seamlessly string thrusting attacks together with virtually no end lag. All you need is a weapon with a thrusting R2, such as spears, great spears, some katanas, the claymore, or thrusting swords. This performs especially well on slower weapons when the opponent is not expecting such a fast follow-up. And even better, if the weapon has a thrusting running R2, as you can string all three together. Keep in mind, this works even if your R2 is not a thrust, so don't let that stop you from adding mix-ups to your build. Now let's put everything to use. A major weakness of impaling thrusts is its 180 degrees tracking. The max angle seems to be about 90 degrees. Most R2s, however, can track in any direction. So even if your Impaling Thrust misses, you can surprise your opponent with a fast and deadly counter hit, as their instinct will usually be to punish. The control you have over holding an R2 means you don't have to release it right away. Charge it for a roll catch, or just for pressure. 
Impaling Thrust's fast startup also means it can come first or second. I encourage you to play around with this. I think you'll find that it really adds a unique and seamless level of flow and control to your game that not many other Ashes of War can provide. Okay, let's wrap up with a quick build discussion. I'm just using a strength build to keep things simple, which also gives me a bit more AR compared to dex. If you went dex, your Ash of War would do more damage, and I'm making a video that goes into that in detail. I'm using Erdtree's Favor, which saves some points and guarantees me around 80 more health versus Blue Feather Branch, which situationally gives more than 200. But you don't have to choose if you hot swap. The Spear Talisman is essential, as you will be doing plenty of counter hits with your surprise R2s and follow up R1 pokes. You can probably get away with less than 101 poise by making good use of the Naginata spacing, especially around Flaming Strike and Storm Stomp. Overall, the two-handed cross Naginata won't break the meta. No, it's not as good or easy to use as power stancing them. But I hope I've shown you that it has a full, comprehensive moveset that can deal with almost any situation. That moveset makes it play differently from any other weapon in the game. So I highly recommend it if you're looking for something rare, unique, and that can still at least keep up with many of the best weapons in the meta. If you like this tutorial, I hope you'll check out my channel, where I featured this weapon against a diverse array of builds and playstyles. Until next time, I'll see you in the arena.